Well, it was a big movie weekend and a big movie week, actually. And the opening of The Sounds of Freedom has actually got a lot of people talking about human trafficking. Here to discuss this a little bit further with me is the editor in chief of the Foreign Desk, Lisa Deftari. She's joining me from Los Angeles. Lisa, welcome back to Bridge City News. Great to have you on again. Thank you for having me, Jeanette. Okay, so as I mentioned, Sounds of Freedom, that movie, it's highlighting the 25 million victims of human trafficking. So, Lisa, following the release of the movie, many people have been surprised to learn that human trafficking and slavery are present in the 21st century, and it's actually much worse today than it was decades ago. I was actually surprised about that, too. Absolutely. And if you haven't seen this movie, I highly, highly recommend it. I was able to see it this weekend. Uh, it's tough. It's hard. I mean, I, I think I cried from a minute and a half into the movie till the end um, because it, it it's it, these are, it's based on a true story, of course. And um, you don't realize the 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 span of this. I mean, um, at the end of the movie, they kind of go through a lot of these facts that people may not know, one of them being that there are 25 million people that are in uh, global, uh, you know, human trafficking uh, situations right now that are victims to all of this, which is, you know, e exponentially higher than, than the number of slaves we had when we actually had institutionalized slavery. Uh, it's a bit mind blowing, um, you know, but it, it I think this, this film should be mandatory. I think everyone should watch it as tough as it is because it, it's it's such a reality. Uh, it goes on all over the world. It goes on in Canada, the United States. It goes on in our hemisphere. And, um, you know, when you watch these children, it is just heart wrenching that this actually happens. Uh, and, um, you know, that that this film is viewed as a partisan film is what is mind blowing to me, that anybody would 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 see this film and be like, oh, that's not for me. That's your side of the polit political aisle. It's absolutely mind blowing. Uh, as I said, it should be mandatory and everyone should really um, do more, whatever we can do uh, to, to fight this. It's it's truly the, the biggest crisis of our time. And I think it's not being given enough attention. Hopefully this film will correct that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head there um, when you said heart wrenching. And Lisa, as a side note, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we had Tim Ballard on our show about a month ago. So he's the former federal agent who the movie is based on. So he was interviewed here on Bridge City News. So it was really really insightful interview just amazing what this what this man went through to try and save these children right and it just goes to show i mean congratulations on getting that interview i've actually reached out to also have him on on the foreign desk because i think everyone should hear from him and you know he was involved in in a uh, a formal capacity meaning he he worked for government agencies and and were, was assigned these cases but then went off on his own because he just he had his basically his hands tied in many cases because of bureaucracy. And he went off on his own in order to, to spend more time, resources, and, and, and really put his full effort towards and dedicated his life uh, to this cause. I mean, he's, he's a tremendous person. And uh, the actor who played him did such a magnificent job of, of really uh, capturing that inner struggle that Tim Ballard had all throughout um, his, his journey. It's tremendous. It's um, it's really I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. And uh, warned us we did we did a few stories to just really start to just try to start um, introducing a lot more of these themes about uh, human trafficking into the mainstream media and to really get those stats out there so people understand the scope of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's definitely one of those stories that sticks with you for a long time. Absolutely. Okay, so switching gears just a little bit here. Uh, so Lisa, we've all heard about these sanctuary cities, the cities in the U.S. that have opened their doors to become these safe havens for the illegal immigrants crossing the southern border. And uh, Elisa, I understand that these sanctuary cities are now having some regrets. Absolutely. Um, look, this is buyer's remorse and only because, not because they're against the ideology, but because just doesn't work out logistically. And that's exactly what we've been saying. Look, um, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, having open borders or having a lax immigration policy as a humanitarian cause. And it's it's nothing humanitarian about it because you see the journey that these yeah, these people have to go through. You see the, the uh, human trafficking that a lot of them become victims to, especially women and children. And then you see many of them dying on the way over. And then you see our side of, 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 of the border where 
These cities cannot absorb more people than they have. We're giving way too many resources and we just don't have the resources to absorb the sheer number. And also we don't have the uh, apparatuses to vet these individuals properly. Just over the last six months, we've had dozens of individuals who were captured at the border who were on the FBI's most wanted terror list. Uh, So, of course, there are bad actors who are taking advantage of the porous border and the vulnerability at our borders. And there are a lot of good people coming through, and they are also victims to a lot of these uh, realities. So um, a lot of these sanctuary cities, led mainly by uh, the mayor of New York, um, uh, Eric Adams, who's come out and said, please stop coming here. Um, And he's been one of the ones who was, you know, open arms about it. But again, when it comes down to it, you just cannot absorb those numbers. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering where was the lack of foresight on their parts to, to not be able to see what was going to happen? Yeah, you know what, Jeanette, it becomes, you know, when when you're a politician, you have to think about, you know, pragmatism. You have to think about, you know, the not just that ideology of, you know, let them come, let them come. We would all love to do that if yeah. we could. You know, I'm the daughter of immigrants, and I think immigration is a wonderful thing. But when it's done in a proper and legal way uh, to give people an opportunity to come over in a safe way, in a way that's safe for us, in a way that our communities can absorb them. And we love immigrants here in the United States. Our country was was founded uh, upon, uh, you know, uh, immigrants who worked very hard to build this country. Uh, So, again, you know, when you look at these politicians who are having that regret, I mean, maybe we can kind of, you know, uh, have some reforms uh, to 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 address address these Mm. issues now in our major cities. Yeah, good idea there. And uh, Lisa, speaking of migrants and the southern border, so the Biden administration is now threatening to sue the state of Texas over this floating border barrier, so the, the buoy barrier, I guess, in the Rio Grande. Yeah, so the the state of Texas and many other border states have decided to take it upon themselves to fortify uh, the border in some ways to create some obstacles um, so that these uh, migrants are not coming over and again being taken advantage of by coyotes and being in boats without life vests and you know it just goes on and on and Texas has set up this buoy barrier and the the uh, nation of Mexico has has threatened Texas to sue Texas to come after Texas I don't, and, and so many capacities. Now the Biden administration is, um, you know, doubling down on that and wants to go after um, the state of Texas because of those barriers. Look, again, we have to connect all of these dots together and come together as, you know, in a nonpartisan way to say what's the best for this country, what's the best to keep both migrants safe, to keep the border cities safe, to keep the sanctuary cities safe, to be able to vet these individuals, to be able to get them over here in in a humane way, uh, to stop the, the, the trafficking of individuals to stop the narcotics and the fentanyl that are coming into our cities uh, and to also, again, have an immigration system that makes sense. So uh, we have a lot on our plates, but again, this the, the feedback really should be informing a lot of the policies and decision making that goes on in Washington. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I mean, I guess it looks like on the flip side, the, the Justice Department, I, I guess why they're doing is they're claiming that these floating barriers are, are a violation of federal law, right? That they could maybe obstruct the efforts of federal law enforcement, pose risks to public safety, you know, inhibit navigation and damage the environment. All, all you know, good points. So, I mean, <laughs> there's two sides to that. You know what, yes, there are two sides to it, absolutely. And you bring up a good point. But when you follow what Border Patrol uh, is telling us, Border Patrol is not speaking the same language as the White House. And that has been an issue and has come up in the media very often. And they're having a hard time recruiting people. They're having a hard time with a lot of these higher ups in Border Patrol um, agencies that are resigning because of the chaos. And they see that what's coming, the rhetoric that's coming out of the White House saying that the the border is under control and everything is, you know, perfectly fine. It's obviously not the case, right? So they're trying to tell us what the realities are at the border. And the state of Texas, just like many other border states, have had to, again, take matters into their own hands because Washington is not hearing them and not, um, you know, not supporting them on on the issues that they have in terms of the, the number of migrants that are coming in daily. Wow. Okay, Lisa, here's one that we haven't talked about in a while. Okay, COVID. So it's been reported that China published, then deleted official COVID data, indicating that over a million more deaths happened than were actually reported. So what can you tell us about this? 
I mean, it makes perfect sense, right? When when have we gotten one uh, honest uh, fact from about COVID, particularly out of Chinese government? Of course, that we have had no transparency and have had demanded transparency many times um, from them regarding COVID. Uh, in this case, we knew that they were underreporting their cases, uh, obviously to make it look like it was less of a crisis than it actually was. They reported something above eighty thousand, and it looks like it was more like one million to one point five million. Huge discrepancy. Right, Jeanette. Uh, look, obviously, we knew that they were having even issues with having proper funerals and p- proper cemetery plots for individuals. The number of people that needed to be buried, um, it just wasn't matching up. We knew that they didn't have proper hospital or um, facilities to treat their COVID patients. So we knew that the numbers weren't adding up. But now it looks like there's actual evidence that showed that they deleted and tried to uh, uh, taper. Uh, tamper with, sorry, with uh, with those numbers to to uh, show lower numbers. Yeah, and and with just over eighty, what they what what did you say? It was eighty three thousand deaths or something, or eighty four thousand. What that they actually reported? That seems a little low for a country so large, especially when that's where Ground Zero was happening. Exactly right. Okay, so Lisa, uh, switching gears here, uh, Iran has assembled an elite military unit with thousands of heavily armed fighters capable of attacking U.S. forces in Syria and Israel. So what can you tell us about this? How is the U.S. and Israel responding to this threat? You know, Israel in particular has always been uh, aware of and focused in on uh, the threat that is Iran's regime because it's a, it's an existential threat. They've they've uh, threatened many times to blow Israel off the map, and Israel doesn't take that lightly. With regards to the United States, they're kind of playing it both ways. The Biden administration and before that the Obama administration both were very cautious of what the Iran regime was up to in terms of its activities regionally, but then, then again would ignore it in order to get a normalization deal, a nuclear deal, the JCPOA in 2015 under the Obama administration, in order to say this is how we're going to curb the actions of Iran's regime, or they would basically separate uh, Iran's uh, actions in Syria or in the region and say this is this deal is just for their nuclear uh, program and then give them billions of dollars, which again, what would they do with that money, Jeanette? They'd put it right back into the regional terror. So it's been this vicious cycle of, of our U.S. policy vis-a-vis Iran uh, in terms of, of, of our Present, uh, our present administration, which again has tried to strike a deal with Iran's regime, which tells the mullahs they're off the hook and they will perhaps get a deal. But on the other hand, setting for, sending fortifications over to uh, the Persian Gulf, we know that they're taking our oil tankers. We know that they are putting money into uh, taking out our assets in Iraq, in Syria. They are putting money into different terror organizations in the region as well. None of that has stopped. Uh, and we know for a fact that Iran's regime and Russia have have uh, joined together to try to diminish uh, the presence of U.S. troops in Syria and, again, are targeting them for that reason. This is a bullying tactic. It's an intimidation tactic. And so is taking tankers in, in the region. And that's exactly what, what they do. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you mentioned Russia there. So speaking of Russia, a report reveals that U.S. weapons meant for Ukraine have fallen into the hands of Russian criminals. So how did this happen, Lisa? You know, this happens quite often. We saw this in 2014 when U.S. weapons fell into the hands of ISIS. And I actually reported on this. I remember breaking the story where we found weapons being sold on WhatsApp. And they literally said made in the USA and they were in the hands of ISIS. And guess how they were getting paid because they couldn't get money or or any sort of banking system, but they were getting paid in Bitcoin. This is way back when, almost a decade ago. Uh, Not much has changed with regards to the US giving lots of weapons to one particular group and then having it fall into the wrong hands. It happens. This is a side effect. The Department of Defense knows about it. And of course, when it happens, when we do identify the hands that it has fallen into, we get all crazy about it because it's obviously never the right people. Uh, and um, we now have have given weapons over to thugs and to uh, different groups who um, may even be fighting the, the Ukrainians. So it's either the Russian bad guys or the Ukrainian bad guys who are not using it in a proper way. So, um, of course, this is something to watch out for. It's, again, very alarming that the United States last week promised another $800 million uh, military package to Ukraine. And then now, again, there's a $400 uh, million uh, package on the table. Um, it's it's never-ending. So, of course, 
side effect of all of this, uh, weapons will fall into the wrong hands. Oh, it's so unfortunate and so scary. But uh, Lisa, Lisa, thanks so much for joining us again today. We are once again out of time. It happens so quickly, doesn't it? <laughs> Yes. Great talking. <laughs> you, you as well. That was Lisa Deftari, editor-in-chief of The Foreign Desk, joining us from Los Angeles.